Welcome to the Music, Money, and Life podcast. This podcast is brought to you by HowToLicenseYourMusic.com. If you want to learn how to make money writing music for TV, films, and ads, visit HowToLicenseYourMusic.com today for a free video series all about how to write music specifically for use in TV shows, films, and commercials. Music, Money, and Life is the podcast that brings together the best minds in music licensing, music publishing, music marketing, and more together in one place. Learn how to license your music and market your music. Learn the latest cutting-edge technology techniques for getting your music heard and making money from your music. Learn directly from the musicians and industry insiders on the front lines of the music business. Please don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review in iTunes. Every positive review helps us rise up the ranks in iTunes, gain more subscribers, and attract more and more great guests. And now, without further ado, here's today's podcast. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Music, Money, and Life podcast. I'm excited to be back today. Today I'm speaking with a composer and producer out of Atlanta, Georgia. I'm speaking with Anthony Clint Jr. Anthony, how are you? Pretty good, Aaron. How are you? Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks uh, Thanks so much for doing this, Anthony. So you were referred to me by Eddie Gray, and Eddie is someone that most of you are probably already familiar with at this point, but how do you know Eddie? How do you guys know each other, Anthony? <clears throat> wow. Um, yeah, Eddie's a, a good friend of mine and great composer. We actually, man, I think I reached out um, to submit to his his publishing company, HF Tracks, um, some years ago. Uh, I think it, man, it probably was about two and a half, three years ago now. And um, just reached out, submitted some music, and then he um, he hit me back and and loved what what he heard, and that was kind of like the start of that relationship and. We've been working together ever ever since. Uh, it's been it's been a really good a good friendship and relationship. Nice. And what kind of tracks are you supplying to Eddie? What kind of tracks are you working on for him? Um, man, everything from uh from from drama to orchestral to hip hop to pop, um, even you know, like singer songwriter stuff. Um, a, a little bit of everything, whatever he needs, usually. Very cool. Well, well, listen, let's do this. Before we jump further into the conversation, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what it is you do? Because I, I know you do a lot of different things. I know you're a composer. You're also a producer, and I know you make beats it, as well. But how would you describe wh- what it is you do? Are you primarily a composer mm-hmm. or primarily a producer? Definitely. So um, I guess I, I would label myself as a, as a producer, um, I started producing about 16 years ago. Um, I was a musician most of my life, just growing up in church and playing multiple instruments and things like that. And uh, just really got into music production around 15 and playing keys around 16 and just really fell in love with the whole process of, you know, just creating a song from scratch, something that no one has ever heard before. Um, so that was kind of the start of the the production journey. And then um, kind of moved on, went to college and, and you know, just honed on my, my keyboard skills and piano skills. And that really kind of took the, the things on the production side to another level. Um, so there I played for a lot of different bands and groups and things like that around the city and in Columbus, Ohio. And um, it just kind of grew from there. I ended up starting um, my own production company um, while I was still in college in, in 2009 and, um, you know, the goal there was just to originally the plan was just to supply music um, to artists, you know, all over the Internet and just kind of have this online music production service. And um, it kind of took a turn in the opposite direction because I was getting requests from, um, you know, from from artists um, personally and in, in, in the city. So I was kind of working on projects hands on in the city. And um, and then that kind of just grew by word of mouth. Um, from different artists around Ohio. Um, and then I, I ran into a college buddy of mine who kind of introduced me to music licensing. And then that's when I started um, just kind of getting into the whole TV and film side of things. And um, at the time, my music wasn't really structured for, you know, for TV and film. Um, so I, I kind of went to some just different events and out in L.A. to kind of learn more about how to, you know, structure music for TV and kind of just how that whole industry worked. Um, so I started getting into that. And then um, <clears throat> while I was working with artists, I, I started songwriting as well. 
Um, so I do songwrite primarily mostly on the, the music side, though. If inspiration's hit, inspiration hit, I'll, I'll write a song. But um, I like to focus on the production. I just love producing music and, and mixing and recording and, you know, just bringing out the, the best possible, um, you know, product for it, whether it's an artist or a TV show or a film or whatever. Um, so, yeah, then I, I moved to Atlanta in, in 2011. Um, it, it's been great since I've been here. I've been able, you know, to produce music for, uh, for Grammy nominated artists such as Tamar Braxton and, um, Case and, and others, um, as well as, um, a, a variety of different, you know, TV shows and networks and, um, you know, just things like that. So yeah, music producer, musician, and occasional songwriter is, is what I would label myself as. Nice, nice. Well, tell us a little bit about what it's like living and working in Atlanta. You know, I've had maybe one or two guests on the podcast over the years that are based in Atlanta. For the most part, the people that I've spoken with have been in L.A., New York, Nashville, places like that. But what is the what's the scene like in Atlanta? I mean, I've heard really good things, but what is it like? What what has it been like in your experience living and working in Atlanta as a musician? Um, I love it, man. The the energy here is it's inspiring. I mean, since the first day I came down, um, it's just a different vibe. I mean, everybody everybody's like on the grind. Everybody's trying to to get to that next level um, musically. So there, I mean, there's always events going on. There's always showcases. Um, there's a ton of talent around here. I mean, from from producers to songwriters um, to artists to um, you know, the, the musicians, it's, it's just, it's a great city to be in if you're, if you're into music, um, especially hip hop music. You know, we have, uh, we pretty much have hip hop on lockdown here. I mean, all of the dopest hip hop talent, you know, is coming out of Atlanta from the South. So it's, it's a great city to be in, man. Nice. Do you, do you perform live at all, Anthony, or are you mainly in the studio for the most part? Uh, mainly, Mainly in the studio now. I used to perform live and do a lot of live gigs in, in college. And then um, it was just the, the wear and tear, man, on, on equipment and time and gas. And it was just it was exhausting, man. So I, I, I wanted to kind of settle down and just really lock in on, on studio work. So that's that's where I am primarily. Nice. Yeah, that seems to be the consensus, you know, for the most part of the people that I speak to that are pursuing and focusing on licensing is that they prefer to get away from performing live and really focus on, on just writing and producing music. I, I seem to be one of the few holdouts. Like I, I really still enjoy playing live. I, I mm. love it as much, as much, if not more, as I love writing songs and recording them. I, I really love performing live. But let me ask you this, Anthony, of the music you're licensing. Is it, for the most part, your music or the artist you're working with or both? Um, primarily it's been my own tracks, but recently um, I have been working with um, – with a group um, called APX, the APX band, and we actually we actually have a, a Netflix um, film placement in the works for them. Uh, so I've been working real close with them to try and get get them some some placements and um, you know just opening opportunities up um, for new producers and up and coming producers um, to you know to get that exposure and get those placements on TV and film. So I've been doing a lot, I guess, focus a lot more on, on kind of giving back and, and bringing other people into you know music licensing who who may not you know thought to kind of to go that route musically cool and just to give people an idea of some of the places you've had your music placed you've had music on tbs the oxygen network bravo the show bad girls ncaa true tv i'm scrolling down here hollywood and football um, you've had a lot of different placements on a lot of different shows and, and networks. What kind of music, Anthony, are you placing for the most part? Hip hop and pop music. Um, and then I'll have I have an occasional show where it's more so um, like the, the the adult contemporary or like um, inspirational kind of bright sounding music, you know, piano, pad, strings, things like that. Um, but yeah, most the majority of my placements have been like hip hop and pop. Cool. And who are you placing your music through? I mean, I know obviously Eddie Gray is somebody that you work with, but are you placing music through through other libraries as well? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, different libraries and, and publishers such as Eddie and um, uh, BMG. Um, there's a, 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 a sub library through BMG um, that I work closely with as well. Cool. How many different libraries are you affiliated with? 
Sheesh. Well, <laughs> I lost count. I, I lost count. The thing is, when I, I guess when I started this whole music licensing journey, the goal was just to really get um, get in touch with as many companies as possible. And then from there, it kind of narrowed down to, to the companies that um, that I worked well with and that I seen were, you know, were getting placements the most. Um, so uh, I'm probably signed up with with quite a few companies. But as far as ones that actually work well and, and, and get placements on my behalf, I would say it's a solid, a good handful, um, about three, three to five that I really focus on on making um, good music for and, and submitting to on a, a consistent basis. Nice. Now, how does it work? Because I know you said that you're primarily a producer, but you also create your own music. How does it work in, in terms of juggling those two different things? Do you <coughs> sort of go back and forth? How do you how do you balance those two different things? Yeah, definitely. That's a good question. Um, I, I, I set up a schedule. Um, so, um, you know, Sunday, Monday and Tuesday, I dedicate towards um, composing music for licensing myself. And then um, Wednesday, I'll kind of use as a, a admin day. And then Thursday, Friday and Saturday, I'll focus on artist projects. If, you know, I'm working with the artist um, specifically, I'll just kind of focus on that. Or if I'm if I'm working on music that I want to send to to other artists to pitch for for placements or, um, you know, projects like that. So that's how I kind of split it up and balance it. Cool. So you're doing three days of writing, one day of admin and three days of production. Yeah, definitely. And then what are you doing on your admin days? Usually editing um, content and, and creating content and um, just kind of coordinating with with my assistant on on what you know, what to post for the week and um, emails, maintenance of the website, things like that. Cool. How big is your catalog? How many tracks do you have in your catalog? Um, Man, I would say I think we're at. I don't know, a little over 500 right now. If if I'm going off of the the CSAC um, repertoire list, I think it's around 500, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, and you're with CSAC? Is that what you said? Yes. Cool, and what are the, you know, I'm with ASCAP, and I think most of the writers that I work with are mm -hmm. either with ASCAP or BMI. What What is it like working with CSAC? What are the pros and cons of working with CSAC? <coughs> Yeah, um, I started out with BMI and then and then switched over to CSAC. Um, CSAC for me was it, it was a it was more family oriented. Um, they really really strive to to support um, the independent producers and, and songwriters, um, and I really love that. And being in in Atlanta, um, they had an office here, so it was easy to um, you know to just go in and talk if you had questions, give them a call, set up a meeting. Um, they were really, really accessible. Um, I didn't, I didn't have that accessibility with BMI um, when I came here. When they did have an office here in Atlanta, um, so it was just, it was a little different. I, I like that, just that, you know, that person, personal touch um, that CSAC gives, and um, yeah, I mean, they're just, they're great. They, they put on a lot of events as well, um, from showcases to. Um, just informational um, forums from, you know, entertainment, uh, entertainment and entertainment attorneys and lawyers, uh, as well as, you know, just different artists and producers that that you would look up to. And I mean, you could just gain so much information um, from their events. I, I thought that was really, really cool. So I, I definitely wanted to partner up with them and um, and start that relationship. Cool. And would you say the performance royalties that CSAC distributes, is it pretty much comparable to ASCAP and, and BMI? What are the, I guess, pros and cons? I mean, I, mean, I know at the end of the day, they're pretty much the same in terms of what they pay, but has that been your experience mm -hmm. working with CSAC? Yeah, they, they, it kind of balances out. Um, <clears throat> I mean, just, just from, um, from BMI to to CSAC, I mean, it, it kind of evened out. I know on BMI, BMI had a few a few royalty checks, um, and it yeah, I mean, it, it's no major difference. One one bonus with CSAC is that if you're if you're getting radio play from artists and things like that, um, CSAC play pays um, radio royalties uh, monthly, so that's that's a bonus with with CSAC. So that oh, would be like the, cool. yeah, the major difference. Okay, I wasn't aware of that, but the performance royalties are still distributed quarterly, right? Yeah, definitely. Cool. Well, let's um, let's shift gears. One of the main reasons I wanted to bring you on the podcast when 
Eddie introduced you to me in terms of being a guest on this podcast. He said that you make beats and I know you have a section on your website where you sell beats. Can you tell us about that and how that works? Yeah. So I recently um, opened up the my personal beat store, which is called Clint Beats. And pretty much what I wanted to do was just uh, make quality beats accessible to to independent artists around the world who may not have access to, you know, the the same quality um, that you would get from, you know, from Grammy Award winning and, and nominated artists and producers. Um, so I wanted to give them an opportunity to, in a way, kind of, you know, work with me um, and collab and, and kind of have have that sound for a lower, you know, a way lower budget. Um, so it's, it's kind of set up as a, it's, um, it's licensing in a sense. Um, uh, whereas, you know, I have a, a list of tracks that are available for, um, non-exclusive license. Um, that way they don't have to break the bank. They can still work within their budget and still have, you know, quality tracks to, to write to and, and create, you know, their EPs or projects, um, on so that that was my way of kind of you know just giving back to the the indie community um, and just opening up you know that door to to have that that high quality production. So I've heard this term beats a lot over the last couple of years, and I think mm-hmm. I pretty much understand how this works. But I want to make sure we're on the same page. So people can go to your website; they can buy these obviously pre-made beats that you've already created, and then they can. Mm-hmm. Do what on the top of it? They can sing on the top of it. They can do hip hop, rap. What is the application in which these beats are typically used? Yeah, they can. Um, they can do. They can write over it, uh, sing, rap. Um, if they want to just buy it to listen to or or use for a you know just a a video project or a spoken word project, they can do that as well. Um, so yeah, I mean it. it they're there's limits to what you can do and how many units you can sell um, because of that license. And, you know, when you download it, you get, you know, a, an agreement stating those terms. Um, but, yeah, pretty much they're they're free to write, sing, rap, um, spoken word, whatever they want to do with it. And can they then turn around and license that into like a TV show or a film? Is that allowed within mm-hmm. the parameters of the license? Now that. That's where the limitations come in. Um, now, this can be negotiated depending on the producer. If if they want to allow that, you know, they're they, they're able to if they, you know, word that in their contract. Um, but in my agreement, I don't allow broadcast rights. Um, it's only for, you know, just for an EP or a project or even a, a, a video on YouTube. Um, but as far as the TV film thing, I, I limit that um, just because, you know, I, I don't want the... <laughs> And I don't think music supervisors want the headache of trying to track down who owns what. And they got a thousand different versions of this song out and, and track. So I kind I like to keep it. I like to keep it separate. You know, the beat store tracks are for the beat store. And then my my music licensing tracks are, are for music licensing. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. And so do you make good money from from selling beats? Is it successful? Do you sell a lot of them? Um, I just started, so I've, I've been seeing, I've been selling maybe one a week. Um, so it's, it's really new. I'm new to it. I've never, I've never tried this, I guess this, um, this way of, of, of selling beats or producing beats. Um, and most of that is because I just, I didn't understand it at first. Um, but as I looked, looked and studied more into it, um, it, it made sense from, because especially when I got into music licensing, and I looked at, you know, selling beats. I was just like, OK, well, this is kind of the same thing. It's just a different um, a, a different market, I guess, uh, versus it's, it's not music supervisors and TV shows. It's just independent artists. Um, the difference is is whether or not you um, you sell exclusive rights, um, you know, you license it non-exclusively a bunch of times. And then, you know, some people will sell exclusive rights and then that one person um, just owns the beat. Um, that I kind of, I limit it. I, I don't sell exclusively. It's just non-exclusively. Um, because I, I, again, I didn't want that, that confusion. Mm. And then if you sell them exclusively, you would charge more, right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Because aren't there guys, I mean, I've heard of people that are doing this, that are selling beats that are super successful, that, that make a lot of money doing this. Do you know mm-hmm. of people doing this that are that are really successful? 
Yeah, definitely. I follow uh, a few guys, man. Like, I mean, super talented producers, um, Curtis King, um, Tone Jones, like these guys are, I mean, they're making a killing and they're, they're really, really great at what they do. Um, so yeah, there's definitely guys out there. Superstar O, um, is another one. I mean, they're, they're, they're doing really good and selling beats, uh, to independent artists all over the world. That's awesome, man. It seems like you're a uh, a pretty savvy business guy. I mean, it seems like you've diversified your revenue streams really nicely. I mean, you're you're doing composing and writing. You're doing production. You're you're selling beats. I've noticed you're also selling books and, and resources and things of that nature. What um what advice do you have for people that want to follow in your footsteps? I mean, most of my my listeners are if not semi-professional already, they're aspiring to do licensing and publishing professionally. You know, people people want to figure out how to make money from this. What advice or tips do you have for writers that are new to this that want to follow in your footsteps? Yeah, definitely. Um, I, my advice would be to keep going. Um, there's a, I actually just did a, a video on this, uh, for my YouTube and pretty much I was just, just saying like, there comes a point, especially in music licensing, where you have to put in a lot of work before you see any fruits of your labor. And it gets really tough, man, because, you know, when I first started in, in music licensing, it was like, you know, you're knocking out tracks, you're submitting them, they're accepting them, but you don't see anything for quarters and, you know, maybe, I think it was about a year and a half um, before I even seen anything. And it's it's that point that you have to work past to to really reap um, to really reap the benefits. Um, so uh, the main thing would be not to give up, um, to keep going and just just believe in yourself. Um, you have to be consistent um, and you have to you have to create consistently. You have to create um, often um, because you can't. You can't create five tracks, send them off, they get accepted and then just sit and wait and do nothing like you have to create. You have to submit and you have to forget about it and just repeat the process. Um, just cr- keep cranking out tracks, keep sending them. Um, and then, um, you know, eventually things will start to snowball and um, and you'll see your, your hard work pay off. Um, also, I would encourage everybody to to really understand the business of music and the different aspects um, of how you can generate revenue. Um, I think that's one of the hardest parts for musicians and artists and um, producers is really monetizing um, their craft. So really study and and look into ways you can monetize your craft. Um, It doesn't just have to be the beat itself. You know, from a, a producer's perspective, you can sell, you know, loops and, and, um, drum kits and just kind of break, you know, deconstruct your tracks and, and sell, you know, portions of those sounds that, that you've created over the years and turn them into, to sound kits and sound packs and then resell those to, um, to other producers who may need sound. So just really study, understand the business, understand publishing. Um, you know, if, if you don't understand an agreement or a contract, um, you know, get an entertainment lawyer <clears throat> and and have them look over it so that, um, you know, you're you're put in the best situation possible um, legally and you're protecting yourself and your rights and just make sure, you know, you understand what you're getting and, and what you're not getting. Yeah, man, th- that's really exciting stuff. I, I feel like I feel like in a lot of ways right now is actually a really exciting time to be a musician just in terms of the sheer number of different ways there are to monetize music currently. I mean, there's things like YouTube and Spotify, obviously music licensing, music production in your case, video games. There's a, there's a lot of different ways currently to make money from music. And obviously you need to sort of learn each different medium and learn how to maximize your results in each different medium. But there's a lot of ways to make money right now if you know what you're doing. But I feel like in terms of licensing, one of the key things you said in this podcast so far is that you have a catalog of like 500 tracks. You have a really large catalog. I know Eddie Gray, the other, you know, another composer I work with a mm-hmm. lot has a thousand plus tracks and growing. You need a lot of tracks right. for this to make sense, you know, to turn it into something really substantial. And I work with a, a lot of writers that I do consulting with. I, I did a consultation with someone earlier today and he's like, I have one fully produced track ready to go. And he's like, is that enough? 
And I'm like, no, you need to really build this up to something substantial for it to become something substantial. But let me ask you this question. Um, In the beginning, Anthony, when you were first starting out, how long did it take you until you really started to see things pay off? Uh, it was a, it was a good, well, it was a good year before I realized something got placed, but there later, like a year and a half, two years later, I found out that, um, a track had actually got placed, um, soon after I had signed with, um, uh, with the library out in LA. Um, but of course I didn't, I didn't see it on my royalty statement until like a long time from, from then. Um, but yeah, so that that one was rather quick, but I didn't know anything about it. Then when I got paid for it, it was it was like 47 cent or something like that. Uh so yeah, I mean, man, it t- to see significant money, it was it was a good a good 2 years. Yeah, it takes time, and that's one of the really kind of frustrating and weird things about this business is that a lot of times you don't actually find out about your placements until much later after the fact, you know, three to six months in in some cases. And I've had moments, you know, of real frustration where where I've really been down about my music career and the music I'm making at times. Mm -hmm. And unbeknownst to me, at that very moment, those very periods of frustration, I actually had music that was being placed. I just didn't know about it. And it would be, it's just a weird aspect of this industry. I mean, it would be really nice (laughs) if you would get a phone call or or something, or, I mean, sometimes people do notify you, but a lot of times people don't. And it's just, you you know, you you really have to look at this as a long-term endeavor, I guess. But what were you doing in the beginning? You said it took a couple of years before this really turned into a substantial revenue stream. How were you supporting yourself in the very beginning? So, so I'm a musician as well. So, um, I was, I was, playing for a church and that's kind of how I've made, made my income on, on Sundays. Um, so that was, that was my income that really held me over, um, through until, you know, music licensing started making up a significant income. And then, um, working with independent artists, I had, um, a couple artists where we were <clears throat> consistently working on their projects. Um, so that kept income flowing in. Um, and now, you know, now since I really focused on, the music licensing aspect, and I, I really want that to be um, the majority of of my income, which which it it now is. I'm not exactly where I want to be yet. I'm, I set um, set me a little plan up to to get where I want to get, but um, yeah, that's that's what I was doing, you know, while you know just waiting for things to grow on the music licensing end. Yeah, I think that's a, r- a real tricky thing for a lot of musicians that are pursuing this is that they're looking to make mm. money from their music right away, but it just it tends to take time. It doesn't tend to happen right away. You, you really doesn't. have to, to be patient in this industry. What are your long-term objectives for licensing? Do you have a certain dollar amount you're hoping to make? Yeah, um, I, I set a goal. Uh, what was it? The uh, Last year, the, the beginning of last year, I set a goal. I'm on a five, five, six year. I'm trying. I want to hit six figures uh, within within the next uh, four to five years. Um, so that's that's the goal. I've I've hit five. So now I want to hit. I want to hit six. Nice. And do you feel like you're on track to reach that goal? Yeah, definitely. Um, the main thing is going back to to just being consistent and um, you know just really really cranking out the you know, the number of high quality tracks it takes to really get things moving and, and get things rolling um, and just really multiplying, um, you know, productivity. Um, so, yeah, definitely. This is another question that I've asked quite a few different people that have been on this podcast. I don't ask everybody, but I'm always curious to kind of hear people's take on this. Do you find licensing your music to be artistically satisfying? Do you get that sense of artistic satisfaction when your music is licensed into a a TV show or or a commercial? Do you, do you find this industry to be artistically fulfilling? Mm -hmm. Um, I I would say yes and no. Um, there's a, I guess with, with TV and film music, um, instrumentals when it's instrumental only, um, I love it. Don't get me wrong. I love it. But sometimes I want to take my creativity to the next level as far as, you know, just a full song and a full record. Um, the great thing about music licensing is I'm still able to do that, you know, create full songs for TV and film. Um, so that allows me to really tap into that 
that you know level of creativity um it's just not as much as the instrumental um but you know i i won't complain if <laughs> if i'm working on you know a bunch of instrumental tracks for tv um but yeah i I, I like to I like to balance it out and you know be able to work on on full records from time to time. Yeah, I find licensing to be kind of strange in that in that sense. I mean, for me at least, I find the real joy I get is from creating and producing music. You mm-hmm. know, writing songs and and creating songs. That's really the part that I love the most. The licensing aspect of it. I find that it sort of it lends a certain amount of validity to what I'm doing songwriting wise, but I don't really particularly care about any single placement. I mean, for the most part, unless it's like I landed a TV commercial a few months ago that I was really excited about. Don't get me wrong. I I love the licensing aspect of it, but it's more for me, at least it's more about the process of, of songwriting and creating music. And I feel like licensing, you know, making money from music in general is pretty hard. So I feel like having something like licensing to sort of, give you something to shoot for to give you goals related directly to your music and obviously exactly. making money is great too but for me i guess what i'm trying to say is it's more about the the process yeah definitely i agree because i mean it's when you're when you sit down to work on a track um you know for licensing you know um you know what it takes for a, a track to get licensed um and you know once it's accepted it has potential um, to earn revenue versus if you're sitting down to create a track that, you know, you want to pitch to, you know, a major A-list artist, you don't know what's, <laughs> what's going to happen with that track or that song. So it's, uh, yeah, it's definitely, you know, gratifying when you, when you can sit down, know you're working on something for a specific purpose and know that the chances of it being used and, and you, you being compensated for it is relatively high. Yeah, and then when you when you receive your royalty checks, I mean, when you receive money for music that you've made, anytime you receive money for music that you've made in general, I think it's just a really good feeling. There's, there's something very fulfilling about knowing that you're getting paid for something that you you love doing so much. Let me ask you uh, another question though. Do you f- are you focusing on YouTube at all? Yes, I've been actually for the past two years. I've really been focusing on, on building a YouTube. Um, so I try and post a video um, once every week on there. And, and even recently, I've been even put posting um, um, beats from the beat store on there as well to kind of promote that. Um, so, yeah, YouTube is a, a great platform. Um, so, yeah, I've definitely been been focusing on that more. Cool. Are you have you been monetizing your YouTube videos? So funny story about monetization on YouTube. So in the midst of me building this YouTube channel, um, it, it, it started growing. I picked up momentum. I was monetizing and then they came out with that, you know, the new guidelines. Right. So I was like cranking out content. I was just like, I need to get these videos up um, because I was literally I don't know. I was like a thousand watch time minutes under the 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 guide that you needed to have to continue, you know, being monetized. So. I was I was under that and I hit it the week that they I guess of that deadline. But I guess I didn't hit it in time. Like literally I was probably like a day short Um, and my video, the latest video did like really good. And I was a day short and they took away my monetization. So I had to reapply. So it's like in the process of being reviewed because like I'm way over the the qualifications now. Excuse me. Um, so, yeah, so that's what happened right now. I'm not being monetized, but I was. But now I'm just waiting for the review to come back so they can get me back on board. Have you looked into any other third party services? That, for example, there's companies like AdRev that will monetize your, your tracks, regardless of whether or not it's your channel or if your music is used on somebody else's channel. Have you looked into any of those types of services? Uh, no, I haven't. I haven't heard of AdRev. No, that, that sounds interesting. I do use um, um, Amazon Associates, so I have you know links to all of the, the gear and equipment that I use um, down in the description. 
Um, but other than that, no, that I'll have to look into that. That sounds pretty cool. Yeah, this is something that maybe for those of you listening to this, you might be interested in this. But I had a guy on. I had a composer named Drew Druva Aliman. We did a course together about two years ago, a year and a half or two years ago, something like that. But we did a course specifically on the topic of how to make money on YouTube. And Druva is the composer who, who first turned me on to this service. AdRev, but but the way it works is you upload your tracks to AdRev. It's totally free to sign up. You upload your tracks, and then what they do is they go on YouTube and they scour YouTube to find videos that are using your tracks, whether or not they're your videos or if other people are making videos using your music and they place ads on those videos and then they distribute it. I think it's something like 80% of the ad revenue goes back to you, the, the, the artist. So... So far, I've only uploaded five or six tracks, something like that, and I'm starting to get like ten dollars here, twenty dollars there. But I can see the the potential now. Now, Druva, the guy that I created this course with, is making like fifty thousand dollars a year just from this revenue stream. But he's totally like he's figured out how to dominate on YouTube. He's getting millions of views on, on his videos, and he's um you know it kind of goes back to what we were talking about before is that there's a lot of ways to make money, but you really need to figure figure everything out but yeah definitely check out ad rev i will that, that sounds pretty cool uh, a question about that now do say you have that track on on your channel um like does it they don't because you know how some companies like if you have a track on there and they kind of like block your monetization on um, from youtube or is or can you like whitelist your channel or how does that work i'm pretty sure the way it works i'm not a hundred percent positive, but I'm pretty sure the way it works is you need to own a hundred percent of the rights for the tracks that you upload to services like AdRev. For example, I have a publisher who controls for some of the songs that I signed to her. There's an opt-in to have her do YouTube mm -hmm. monetization. So I couldn't upload those tracks to services like AdRev because she already controls the YouTube and digital media mm -hmm. part of, of licensing. But as long as you own 100% of the tracks, you can upload them to services okay. like AdRev. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'm going to have to look into that. Cool. Well, listen, Anthony, thanks so much for, uh, for doing this today. Thanks to Eddie Gray for connecting us. Great to have you on. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And, and shout out to Eddie, man, for just for making a connection. Nice. Well, let's do let's do a couple things before you go. Let's tell people your website address so people can go learn more about you. Your website URL is clintproductions.com. That's C L I N T clintproductions.com. So definitely go check out Anthony's website, learn all about his music, his production services, and so on. And the other thing I'd like to do is to play one of your tracks at the end of this. I'd like to feature a track from, from every guest that I have on. Do you have a, a track you can send me? Okay, cool. Yeah, I can do that. No problem. Cool. Do you have any idea what the name of the track will be off the top of your head? Do you know what you'll send me? Um, I'm going to, I'm going to have to figure it out. I got to sort through, <laughs> sort through these tracks. Do you know if it'll be an instrumental track? It'll be, it'll be instrumental. Cool. So this is an instrumental track. Yeah, we'll just say it's an instrumental track from Anthony Clinton Jr. And then if you can send me the title of the, uh, of the track after the podcast, I can edit that into the podcast at the very end. Okay, great. Thanks. I appreciate that. Cool. Well, Anthony, listen, thanks so much for uh, doing this today. It was really a pleasure to uh, to speak with you today and have a great day. Will do, Aaron. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. <laughs>